Welcome to this webinar for Africa Climate Week and please note that this session is being recorded. My name is Helen Civil and I'm representing the Resilience Shift, the global hub for resilience best practice. We work to accelerate the theory and practice of resilience, working with partners around the world. Our work in Africa has included two of the initiatives we'll be talking about today that have the city of Cape Town in common and both of them have strong links with the city's day zero water crisis. This webinar explores the learning from day zero for all those tackling the challenges of urban water resilience and for city resilience more generally. Firstly, I'll introduce our two protagonists. Peter Willis is a senior associate of the Resilience Shift. He's originally from the UK, but has lived in Cape Town since 1993, where he has spent 25 years working on strategic issues of sustainability and resilience. From 2002 to 14, he was South African Director of the University of Cambridge Institute for Sustainability Leadership. His focus now is on leadership in the face of crisis and the building of deep resilience, and he's worked with the Resilient Shift on the Cape Town Drought Response Learning Initiative the Resilient Leadership Programme, and he's currently leading weekly dialogues with global climate leaders on our initiative Shifting Climate Leadership in the run-up to the COP26 Climate Conference. Welcome, Peter. Martin Schuler is the London Water Leader at the International Engineering Consultancy, Arup. He's a water and public health engineer working to build urban water resilience and sustainability. He's been leading, with his colleague Louise Ellis, the Resilience Shift's collaboration with Arup and numerous other organisations on the city water resilience approach. This approach provides an end-to-end -end methodology to address urban water resilience through involving all stakeholders to overcome the challenges of fragmented governance. This has been applied in over 15 cities globally and is now being rolled out to six African city regions, including Addis Ababa, Kigali and Johannesburg, to strengthen their urban water resilience. Welcome, Martin. Hello, Helen. Hello, Peter. So, Peter, um, we'll, we'll cut to you first. Firstly, can you introduce the context of Day Zero and give us a bit of detail about what happened? What was the response by the city and its residents and how you got involved? Yes, thanks. And hi, Martin. Um, so I'm going to do it actually, if I may, slightly the other way around in that I'm going to start by explaining how I got involved with this uh, project, the Cape Town Drought Response Learning Initiative, and through that with the Resilience Shift. Um, and then I will give you the background to the drought and how the city responded. So the uh, the drought was a sort of, as droughts are, was a sort of creeping reality which built to a, a really worrying climax at the end of 2017 as we were going into our southern hemisphere summer with very little rain and, uh, and the beginning of 2018. And it was, it was then, early 2018, that I realized that there was an extraordinary amount of adaptation and innovation going on around the city by the city government, by citizens, ordinary citizens, and by businesses. Uh, and I wondered, well, how on earth is all this learning going to be captured and made available to other cities that are going to face this? Because I know there are many cities that will, and even ourselves for next time. And I realized there isn't any um, sort of societal mechanism for capturing learnings out of crises, other than, you know, the odd academic piece of research which disappears onto an academic shelf somewhere. So I thought no, we could do better than this. So I got together with a, a filmmaking friend of mine, Victor van Asvik, and also a Cape Townian, and we embarked on uh, interviewing what ended up being 39 key people who were involved in responding to the crisis from government, business, civil society, and academia. And that resource ended up, it, it is now a freely available website, um, thanks to the sponsorship of the Resilience Shift, um, where you can not only listen to these 39 in-depth um, interviews done on camera, but you can also then see the distilled learning films that we built out of those. There are about 55 of those, so you've got very nearly 100 videos which give you a very comprehensive look at what we can learn out of this extraordinary existential crisis. So that's how it, uh, that's 
how we're, that's why I'm here. <laughs> and uh, I would suggest that um, if we could play that little one minute YouTube film about the project and the resource that we now have. Thank you. So, so I think another one of the key lessons that to remember that and so we have more drafts if you have less power and more difficult to achieve. A few lessons that I think are the same. One is that the critical change and or whether variability is really illustrated in the survey to notice when the crisis really started to be extremely dramatic and managing the crowd and the crowd you have to. Are we going to have to take 20 years? What is just mandated by the climate change? It is our decision. I think that's what we just went through. It's just a powerful and shifting how we've always done things. And that's what pulled us through. Thank you. So, um, that gives you a sense of the 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 volume and the quality of the uh, material we've got. Although we, it's you don't have to listen to everybody at once. I can reassure you. Um, so let me just give you a little bit of background to the the drought and why it revealed systemic problems that um, are now being addressed. I'm happy to say. So Cape Town is a city of about four million people, founded in the uh, late 17th century and it has always been dry there is not a lot of um, naturally occurring uh, easily accessible fresh water here so as the city has grown to its present size a succession of quite large dams have been built out in the mountainous countryside beyond the city's boundary and that water is piped into the city and we've got a very sort of um, well designed reticulation system that brings it to everybody's taps. Although when I say everybody's taps, there's a in the last 20 years has grown up quite a large informal sector of the city where taps are fewer and further between um, and so on. But everybody does have access to municipal water one way or another. That system of relying on those the big six dams uh, are the main ones we use has worked really well over the decades uh, when there has been enough rainfall. But in 2015 through to 18, we had three really tough years of very um, low rainfall. And that, that suddenly put the system under stress and three major weaknesses were exposed. The first was that uh, we were so dependent on stored rainfall. That is, that was 95% plus, 98% really, of our water has always been just rainfall that sits in the dams. Uh, and we realized that that's actually not sustainable to be so dependent on one source. Uh, second problem was that the, um, the city draws its water from these dams, as do the farmers in the surrounding countryside who supply food to Cape Town and, and other parts of South Africa. Uh, and all the little towns out in the countryside as well. And, and that sharing suddenly became a problem because there wasn't enough to go around. And related to that, there was a, a pretty complex governance system that had grown up involving the national department, which sits way away in Pretoria in the, in the national capital. And during this period, and it's still true, it, the national government is run by the Af Af African National Congress and the provincial and city government around Cape Town is run by a different party, the Democratic Alliance. And they don't see eye to eye on a lot of things. And one of the, the cracks, where <laughs> the, the water governance fell through one of these political cracks and, and the relationship was not particularly good in managing this complex sharing system. So under stress, that once again got revealed as an in inappropriately set up bit of governance. So I'm now going to share with you um, just a couple of slides to, to give you a background to what this drought actually was like, what, what it involved. So here we go. Um,
Uh, let's see if this works. Oh, sorry. I've rushed to the end of the slideshow. Um, <laughs> uh, there we go. Right. Let me start with this blanked out right hand side. I just want to show you that the um, the previous several years of um, our dams, these big six dams around the outside of Cape Town, revealed a, a predictably sort of steady pattern of filling up during the winter rainy months, that's sort of from May through to September, and then being drawn down during the hot, dry summers, and then being refilled and drawn down, refilled and so on. So that was the pattern. And everybody's expectations went with that. We, you know, we were, we'd grown lazy. I'm sure the water department within the city were more nervous because they know that the weather can be variable and so on. But for most citizens, it wasn't an issue. Then what happened at that gray bar there shows you a, a dramatic, long, dry, hot summer where the rain came very late and it wasn't very much. And the next two years as well, same story, the rain arrived a bit late and didn't fill up the dams. And in fact, that last one you see there, 2017, the winter of 2017 was a pathetic amount of rain. So we went into the summer of 2018, sort of, you know, October, November, December um, of 2017 and January, 2018 with our dams at exceptionally low levels. Now, uh, by now the um, scientists had been were telling us this is a, a one in 500 year drought that we're in. Uh, so people were starting to get quite alarmed. And I just want you to think for a moment, that yellow circle I put there is to give you an idea of what the, the sort of decisions that the city and provincial government were, were confronted with at that point towards the end of 2017, as we went into 2018, because that dotted line that you see going down towards the bottom corner was their worst case scenario where, because that if you, if you go back to that gray bar at the top of the diagram, that is how much water we Cape Tonians drank and used during a hot, dry summer. So if they expected us to do the same, we were in very, very, I mean, we were in an intolerable situation where the dams would be completely empty uh, and we would have no other way of um, supplying water. So that, you can, uh, that just tells you that it was an exceptionally dangerous period where some very big decisions had to be taken. What you actually see with that sort of solid line that bounces back up was that the rain did arrive in about April, May, June of 2018. And it was quite good rain and the dam started to fill up again. And in the last two years since then, we've had actually very good wet winters. So we're, our dams are now back to being full. But this, I'm, this is to give you an idea of what it was like for the decision makers particularly, as we went into that hot summer of the third summer of the drought. So this is looking at it from a different angle. Um, this tells you about the overall water usage in the city, 4 million people with businesses and, and so on, during the last uh, 10 years. So the, you, if you look at the, the, those peaks during the summers, took us in the previous summer before the drought really began, November, December, January, um, sorry, December 14, the beginning of 2015, we were drinking, sorry, not just drinking, but we were consuming as a city 1,200 megaliters, that's million liters of water every day. Okay, so that was our sort of benchmark of how, how much water we seemed to need as a city during summer. Look at that um, steady decline of water usage during those three years of the drought. Uh, and Peak summer use, I've just told you, there was just shade over 1,200 megaliters, and it got down to a remarkable just over 600 megaliters a day uh, towards the end of December 18, which is our first hot summer after the drought had started to break. So what this tells you is that we had actually learned from between those two points, we had as a city learned to halve our daily consumption of water in the face of a crisis. And 
you might ask quite reasonably, well, how did you bounce back from that? And um, that was a real worry that we would suddenly, the moment the rain started to fall, everybody would switch on the taps and fill their swimming pools again and so on. But actually, this is the maximum rebound in the hot summer of early 2021. So this, this year, uh, we've only gone up to just over 800 megalitres per day. So uh, we obviously don't know how that's going to play out in the next summer and the one after. But as I've told you, we've had very, we now got full dams. So we're in a strong position. And even with the full dams, you can see that our consumption is considerably muted compared with where it was in the old days. So clearly some, some behavior change uh, has, has taken place. So um, I'm going to come back to yeah, Peter, can I can yes. I jump in there? Uh, sure, so, please do. So, so I I've watched many of the films on the website on the the, the drought response learning initiative uh, website, and I mean the films are fantastic. They they give such an insight into how the different city leaders and corporate leaders uh, realised that there was this looming crisis, and then how they responded and how they had to work together, and then how the residents and the businesses you know everybody had to contribute to this this reduction in in water consumption but and it's really interesting to see that the the demand that has that, that has remained reduced over time but i mean what what lessons do you think can we learn for other cities who have been facing similar looming water crises and obviously we're seeing an increase in 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 the cities what 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 are the main lessons would you say are are, are the takeaway so um the engineers here in Cape Town would tell you the big lesson is diversify your sources of supply. Uh, and some cities are, are already in that position of having more diverse sources of supply than we had. And we are busy doing that. Um, so we're much less, we're going to be in the next year or two, we'll be much less dependent on just rainfall. Um, but uh, well, others would be move early. Don't, don't what, what our political leadership did, and you can fully understand why, was they were cautious to ring the alarm bell too early. Because politicians don't like scaring the horses. Um, and uh, But there is actually a, a real value in, in having your citizenry alert and realizing that they may if the rain doesn't come this winter in, in sufficient quantity, for example, you may need to reduce your usage. And actually, the, the city was had been quietly imposing sort of tiers, tiered levels of restrictions. So, like, you know, for, for two or three years during the drought, we knew that we weren't allowed to water our lawns during the day. You could do it maybe for an hour early in the morning or late at night or so. So that was the, the small stuff and it gradually ratcheted up. So we become used to being constrained by the city government because they'd introduced that early on, but it was sort of conflicting with political messaging. And our mayor in the early phase of the drought, she was actually sort of stepped down by her party because it wasn't working out particularly well in the heat of the drought. Um, she was saying her sort of message on media was a well-run city never runs out of water suggesting that we've got this nothing for you to worry about because she wanted people to feel happy and you know happy with the government and so on actually a lot of uh, citizens started asking questions and, and writing to academics saying do you know what's going on because you know you've got the figures can you help us because we're not getting them from the government and there was a growing anxiety. And when she was removed from that position of managing the drought, uh, which took a huge sort of political ruckus and came quite late, the, her replacement started releasing data to the public. And the public's response was fantastic. People said, oh, right, OK, so we've really got to dramatically reduce our consumption. And we did. So take the public into your trust. Uh, because this is a we thing. No, no, no government can can manage uh, a disaster like a drought on its own. So, the so other sorry, thing, Peter, sorry, yeah, go on. So just to say, so then you were talking about releasing data. So, so the city mm. was making the data 
of of what available to consumers data about the day-to-day -day state of the dams the state okay. of um who was consuming what do you know what they did they actually produced with help from the university of cape town um economist they produced a map of all the whole city showing each for each uh residential and business plot um a, a simple color code for is this but is this house using less than the limit or more or do we not have accurate data so people could go on the the city council's website and look at their neighborhood and say are we a good neighborhood hey there are four people in my street but over over the limit what do i do about that do i engage them in conversation it was a it was a bit risky but generally it was very well People, to, people realize that we were in a mortal crisis. And so that kind of measure was thought to be necessary. Okay. And there are one or two other points, if, if, I, if I've got Please. time, I would just throw in. One thing that was really impressive was how um, at high speed, the provincial and city government reached out to the business community, realized that they hadn't got a database of which businesses were using how much water and rapidly tried to rep um, repair that and, and ended up with a very good database and started asking them, what can you do to help? And businesses responded phenomenally. I mean, they not only sorted out their own consumption dramatically, but um, said, how can we help? Can we transport water if it comes to that? You know, can we talk to our community? We've got really good communications. We can do adverts for you, etc. So that so build networks with your business community ahead of time. That's the other bit of learning I would suggest. And the last one I would say is that the the city government particularly developed a really um, agile project management capability when it realized that there were all kinds of scenarios because you don't know the drought whether it might rain next week and you can stand everybody down but you have to be ready for the worst possible scenario and so on and so they they in through all of this they realize they have to be super alert very flexible willing to drop a strategy at a moment's notice if it if it's not working and so on and that project management capability they transported into the covid crisis and they've actually won global awards for their responsiveness in the face of COVID. And I've talked through the Resilient Shift project. I, I talked with the guy who set up all of that. And he said, there's no question that what we learned in the drought, we, we took into COVID. Um, so use the <laughs> never waste a crisis. Yeah, uh, use it uh, particularly to develop flexible teams that can project manage fast moving scenarios that, that's fantastic peter i i think we we found that in the resilient leadership initiative too didn't we where where a number of participants yeah. were speaking about how battle memory of kind of previous crises in their cities had actually helped them to be much better prepared for covid um yeah at this point i think uh, let's let's um, hand to martin and martin you've got a, a, a comment on on peter's notes. yes if, if i may peter that's fascinating a really interesting presentation um what one question i've got there is the um the graph you showed um current consumption levels um mm. out there. i'm just wondering if you've got a sense um in terms of whether that reduction is down to technology. So are there technology interventions that they've made or is uh, it behavioral change that's sort of sticky and, and, and people are, are now are thinking about water in a different way? So I'm, I'm really curious about how that sort of yeah. plays out over time. Well, that's a, a wonderful question, Martin, and both. The, the stickiness, um, I'm, I'm, there may be some polling data that's been done by academics um, going out and asking people or, you know, what are your habit, water habits and how do they compare to before the drought and during the drought and so on. I haven't seen them, those, those results. But just from talking with other Cape Tonians, I would be, my expectation is if we hit another dry winter, people would very readily slip back into having buckets in the shower and only flushing the toilet when you really need to and so on and so on. Those things are, they're there in memory, obviously not forever. Um, 
But the second thing, the technical thing is that, well, you start with the buckets. You know, every household now has more buckets than they used to have. And you need buckets if you're going to, to save water. It's a very, you know, you learn that during a drought, lots of containers everywhere so you can reuse water. But more importantly, uh, for several months during the peak of the drought, the roads were clogged with trucks carrying these big um, plastic, rigid plastic rainwater harvesting tanks, which uh, households all over the place, if they could afford them, were installing to give themselves a little bit of security of supply. So any rain that did fall stayed. And um, I reckon, you know, it's a complete thumb suck that we've actually gone and private privately acquired a small dams, additional dam, an urban dam in the form of all those tanks. Mm. And then a whole lot of people drilled into the aquifer underneath us. Uh, that's more problematic in my view, because nobody knows exactly the state and size of that resource. And it's a free for all where you, if you can afford it, you drill down, you've got potential problems, but, but it is also a, a resilience buffer. Thank you, Peter. That's really interesting. But in a sense, it took it took a burning platform to create that I suppose, opportunity, didn't it? You can't do that stuff ahead of time. But yeah, I'm afraid we humans are just not built that wired that way. Um, we need to be shocked awake before we will take action. But boy, do we take action when we need to. Mm. It's quite interesting, I think, as well, Peter. I, I remember you were saying that Cape Town had already at the time been engaging with the concept of resilience and had joined 100 resilient cities and so it was already thinking hard as, as a kind of city leadership how it might build that resilience and I think Martin you were already working in Cape Town at the time I, I, I believe and um, could, could you explain a bit more about how how you you started getting involved with Cape Town's uh, water resilience um, and what was the impact of the crisis on on your work? No, absolutely, Helen. We we have been working for a number of years on something called the City Water Resilience Approach, um, which um, we developed um, with um, a number of key partners, but it was based in part on um, work that Arab had been involved in uh, back in um, 2012, I think it was, in terms of the City Resilience Index. So we, we were looking at the city resilience index and part of that was had a, a small focus on water but uh, many of the cities where it's been applied were saying that water was one of the key issues so we took a deeper dive into um into water and created the city water resilience approach um as part of that um we went out to a number of um cities uh to invite them to um help us co-create the um the approach so together with the um, with our sponsors, the Rockefeller um, Foundation, uh, the Resilience Shift, we 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 moved ahead with a a key a group of um, individuals, including the World Bank, um, academics such as UMass in the States, um, and others. Um, and uh, Cape Town, um, I suppose, um, was part of that before, or well, I suppose, emerging uh, drought. So. We'd embarked on this work in 2016. So it just happened that we were in Cape Town helping to pilot and develop um, the city water resilience approach, effectively landing in the middle of, a, I suppose, a, a laboratory where things were happening around us. Um, so we, we saw that happening. Um, we were uh, creating this approach, which looks holistically. It's not just at uh, droughts. It looks at all water impacts, thinking about the shocks and stresses that uh, that cities face. Um, I think the important thing for us um, is that it, it, it's a more strategic level. So what we weren't doing there was helping to solve the current crisis, but in the way that Peter talked about, we were we were learning from from what was happening uh, around us. So I think the um, the CWRA, the City Water Resilience Approach, really benefited, I suppose, from from that tragic event. Um, in um, in Cape Town, and um, we've now gone on to apply, as as you said, Helen, at the beginning of the um, of the session, we've applied that learning in in some fifteen cities globally. So, not just uh, in Cape Town, but we've been working um, internationally in Miami, uh, in Mexico City, in Hull, in the UK, 
And more recently, uh, we've been embarked upon a programme in Africa looking at urban water resilience. So that learning um, is now um, being applied um, in cities such as Addis, Ababa in Ethiopia, Kigali, in Rwanda, Johannesburg. Um, we've just started work there in South Africa, and we've just started work in Abuja um, in Nigeria. So um, in some senses, um, as uh, Peter indicated, so that they, you know, don't waste the crisis. Uh, so we've been learning, um, learning from that. And the, the CWRA is very simple in its approach, really. It's just a, a five-step end-to-end pro process of, of looking and understanding urban water resilience. So it starts off, um, really, you need to understand and, and the importance of data as Peter mentioned earlier, it's really understanding what the situation is in terms of resilience. And what we do is harvest all that data and create um, a profile for the city, so-called city characterization report, which is open, transparent, um, and can be um, interrogated by all parties. And at the same time, we are gathering um, the key stakeholders who are involved in uh, water resilience. And that's really complex. So the governance um, of water in the city, such as Cape Town or any other city is super complex. And it's not just the um, kind of the usual suspects. It's not just the, the water supplier and maybe the city. Um, there's Everybody's involved it's in some extent in terms of water. And we've heard about the importance of businesses and business water use industries, farming, agriculture. So it's, it's really quite complex. And, um, Together with the, the resilience shift, we've created tools that help us to understand that complexity. So I have a tool um, called R Water, which is freely available. Um, it's an online tool which helps map that um, um, complex governance structure and really helps you to understand or any, anybody wants to interrogate that, um, how shocks and stresses um, uh, can manifest themselves in a city. So once you've gathered the key stakeholders, you can map um, their roles and responsibilities and then apply shocks and stresses. And if you're anticipating a drought or a flood event, um, you can see where, where's your strengths and weaknesses in that governance structure. And it's having that foresight and preparedness that um, again, Peter talked to, um, really helps that in the moment of crisis, um, you've already had that um, thinking already applied. And, and Martin, can can I jump in here? I I, I remember um, talking with you about this before, and you you'd explain just how many people were involved in what the workshops in different cities around the world in in developing this. And obviously, you're looking at it from a catchment perspective. So the farming community, the business community, the city leaders, but also I, I'm interested in how how does the the sort of the population feed into this is is there a way of engaging with with the the community that links in with the behavior change that peter's been talking about and increased awareness on their part in, in terms of, of resilience yeah absolutely um so while, whilst we're out creating um the city water resilience approach um you know we engage with over 700 uh, key stakeholders to help create it um we um we surfaced around about 1,600 shocks and stresses that either help or hinder um, your urban water resilience. But I think what really um, came home to us was whilst we're in Cape Town is the importance of the citizen. And actually, you could argue that um, you know, that resilience really is built around the response of, of citizens. It's not just uh, the structures around them, but it's um, it's about everybody getting involved. And I think that lesson that we learnt in Cape Town, we've reapplied um, every every um, uh, time subsequently. So we do get the voices um, of citizens, typically through um, uh, uh, citizen groups. Um, so we carefully um, pull them through into the process. So we ensure that their voices are heard when we're thinking about um, urban water resilience, because effectively what we're going to do will impact on the citizens of, citizens of a particular city. So they need to be involved. By involving them early, they can better understand what their responsibilities might be um, moving forward. So absolutely, they're a key stakeholder in that process. And often it's a voice that's not heard um, in certain cities around the globe. Um, so it's super important 
uh, to bring that in. And and just I mean thinking back about other cities then. So so we've heard from Peter about some of the learning that, that cities can 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 take away in terms of of, of governance and and um, you know other just thinking about what leaders need to do. But I think other cities again that this threat of water stress is looming. I mean how how what what other initiatives are, are, are happening that. Um, that link with this growing recognition that urban water resilience is critical both for climate climate resilience, but also just in terms of, of ensuring sort of economic, social, health and well-being for, for, for people around the world. Yeah, so I, I, I think uh, circling back to Cape Town, I think Cape Town really focused attention, the world's attention, both on the risk and the impact of water shortages. I mean, Modelly, it, you know, Cape Town is an advanced city, so um, the thinking was, well, there goes Cape Town. What about other cities around the globe? And and you look at other cities, um, and they are facing similar situations. So you can reel off cities: Chennai in India, um, Mexico City, Cairo, Tokyo, Sao Paulo, Beijing, you know, just to name but a few. Uh, they are facing um, a, a water shortage crisis um, similar in nature to, to Cape Town. So it, it, by taking that, um, those early steps and, and preparing yourself, both from an engineering uh, aspect, but also bringing the citizens along so that you're ready uh, in, in, um, in the case of um, uh, severe droughts, you can respond accordingly. And let's not forget, the, it, it obviously was a huge disruption um, and it's a huge uh, economic Im impact. Um, the, the water shortages um, caused uh, the, um, many industries to, to cease operating. Um, it stopped um, um, a lot of tourists visiting Cape Town. That's a big um, source of revenue. So a massive economic impact from, from the humble um, uh, you know, um, availability of water, something that people um, take for granted, I think. You turn on it's, the tap, you've got water. There, there is one film in the the Cape Town Drought Response Learning Initiative where I think it's somebody from Woolworths, obviously a, a huge corp, a huge retail organisation, and I think they they were talking about how when the when they started thinking about the impact of of a reduction in in water supply for their employees, for the drivers of their vehicle, you know, it, it, there was a, a massive knock on yeah. effect on just how they could operate their business when people were also concerned about how their own families would be able to get water and so on. And it, it yeah, it's very in, insightful. Um, just just also, I think we've talked a lot about drought here, but I think when you talked about that list of cities facing water problems, there's also other issues that affect them, whether it's um, desal uh, salination and sea level rise or silting up or I mean, there is all of this learning is applicable to other scenarios, I, 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 um, I question. No, and absolutely. So um, you can apply the learning and um, many of the cities that were involved in um, in the uh, development of the CWRA um, were keen to learn from from Cape Town. Um, even during during uh, the experience, so um, uh, Gareth Morgan, who's the um, chief resilience officer for um, for Cape Town, was hugely in demand about um, how did the response work? What are the key learnings? So, being part of that ecosystem of um, um, within the CWRA, that learning was immediately like wildfires being shared uh, from uh, from Cape Town straight into um, Miami. Miami facing a different particular situation there in terms of, you know, um, uh, sunny day um, uh, flooding. So they were looking at inundation from the sea, uh, but many of the learnings uh, you can um, you can uh, relate across. And actually, if you if you go down uh, further, actually, if you think about resilience, um, many of the uh, systemic issues, um, uh, whether they be uh, the response to um, drought or flooding are very similar in terms of what underpins them uh, and, and really get into the, the root of those issues. Um, we've been able to then uh, provide that um, learning in, back into to the city subsequently. So absolutely, it doesn't, doesn't matter what, um, what, tip, uh, what shock or stress you're facing, many of the responses are going to be similar. And, and um, Martin, I, I believe you, you've been involved in um, the 50 Litre Home Coalition, which, as, as I understand it, it's cities around the world who are 
um, inspired actually by the example of Cape Town's demand um, reduction and, and behavior change and, and are looking to to um, apply some of that that learning with their own citizens. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about that, please? Yeah, absolutely. And, and it's another thing that um, um, the, the drought event in Cape Town inspired the 50 litre home. You know, how do we live in the future um, with a home with only 50 litres per person uh, per day? Um, and so uh, um, a coalition has formed around that, the so-called 50 litre coalition. Um, and that's uh, a number of corporates um, led by the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, the World Economic Forum, um, the World Bank's involved, but importantly, it's the likes of Electrolux, uh, IKEA, Cola, P&G, Suez. They are looking um, at how they can um, nudge or change the way that we, we look at cities uh, moving forward. And, and you know, one of the things that um, they, they asked us recently was, um, can we apply uh, circular economy thinking uh, to cities in the terms of water? How does water reuse, how does that come into play? Um, at what scale is it important? So we've been working with the coalition partners to develop uh, that thinking. Uh, we have a white paper uh, that's been well received and now translated to many languages available. And, um, and, and that's, that's exploring what it means at a household level, what it means at a, a neighborhood level in terms of water use, and what, it, what does it mean at a district level? So how do all these things um, actually reinforce um, urban water resilience by just thinking about water in a different way how can we turn what's a waste product into a usable product that we can use within the home uh, and then uh, build that urban water resilience in the face of um, scarcity, but also provide access. Um, so a number of cities around the globe don't have water 24 seven. Um, how do we make that um, water reuse go further uh, and make accessing water easier uh, again for the, for the citizens of those uh, cities around the globe. So um, yeah, that learning um, from Cape Town, again, has been applied in the 50 litre home. Um, and we, we have a, a short video actually of, um, Great. Um, I don't know if that's available, if Gemma can play that to give the highlights of an overview.
thank you for playing that. Um, I ju just one final thought from me. Um, both the 50 litre home initiative work uh, and our work um, working with cities in Africa and wider, the city water resilience approach, we um, will be presenting that work um, in Glasgow at COP26 in the water pavilion. So if you want to hear a bit more about either of that, uh, or those uh, approaches, please come and see us with our city partners and collaborators. So it's um, yeah, it's really important to um, to share this learning uh, so that others then can um, take that on and, and perhaps take it further. So um, yes, it's it's super important to um, that water is recognised at COP26, and uh, many of the impacts of um, climate change will be felt through water. So increased flooding, increase water shortages. Um, so these are the things that um, uh, that we're living in now and will be living into the future, how to manage um, our water resources and build water resilience. That's great, thank you, yeah. Martin. And Peter, uh, any final thoughts from, from you? Uh, well, first of all, just to thank Martin for his pioneering work. It's really, I actually attended one, if not two um, workshops before I really, uh, before I got involved in the the film project, and the early days of the drought of your with your CWRA, CR, got it, CWRA, got it. yes. <laughs> uh, I mean, my acronym CTDRLI is even worse. So, um, and I I found it really fast, absolutely fascinating. I remember sitting at a at a table in the workshop with three or four others, and we had a huge piece of paper, and we had to make a map of the water system for Cape Town. And it was such an interesting exercise. Um, I, I One of the rare moments when I think, gee, this is more fun than anything, <laughs> being in a thinking exercise like that to try and get your head around a system that you live in the middle of. So thank you. Um, no, um, I, I think, you know, we could go on a lot longer. There are many, many th ways this conversation spins out, but um, I really appreciate the opportunity to share what we did and, and our website um but drought we'll response learning you know, it's all yeah, over there it's yeah amazing. and it's go have a look you'll be amazed that my <laughs> filmmaking partner is a proper filmmaker and it's beautiful stuff and and thank you so much peter thank you so much martin um for really um insightful conversation i think just just a final thought from from me i think um we we talked about this all together um, at London Climate Action Week a while back and we had um, uh, one of the, the leaders of, of um, water supply in London talking about how actually London as a city where everybody thinks it rains all the time is also not immune to its own drought and in the year of the Olympics there was a real real prospect that it could have run out of water had the rains not not kicked in as they should have done so so I think every city everywhere is not mm. immune to yeah. some kind of water uh, crisis um, respective to its own challenges for resilience. So city leaders, um, there, there's a lot of information in all of the links that we shared today, which I think city leaders and those, those thinking about the challenges of resilience, both for water and for cities more generally, will, will find really useful. So thank you so much. Um, everybody who's joined us today and um, we look forward to uh, following the rest of Africa Climate Week's fantastic events uh, throughout the week. Mm, thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Helen. Thank you, Peter. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.